All right. Happy to have my next guest on the Sports Card Nation guest line. He's a very experienced uh, author, writer, uh, newspaper, uh, news, uh, newsman. Uh, has worked for the New York Post, the Daily News, ABC, NBC, double-digit years. I'm sure with, with his resume, I probably left something off. If so, I apologize uh, in advance. But without further ado, Mr. Dan Good, welcome to Sports Card Nation. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. So you 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 got a book coming out here coming up in in April of, of twenty uh, twenty two. Uh, it's not your first book. Uh, it's just going to be uh, your your latest one, and it's about a, a polarizing uh, athlete, baseball player who's uh, unfortunately uh, passed on, but uh, nineteen ninety six uh, MVP, uh, Mister Ken uh, Caminiti. I mean, he's definitely. Uh, a polarizing uh, athlete, as I, I said, but I guess the first question is for you. You know, why why Ken Caminiti? It's a really good question, and I've I've had that question asked to me so many times as I've wanted to talk to people about this project, and I think it really comes down to uh, just the guy he was, the player he was. You know, as a baseball fan in the 1990s, this guy was such a badass. Uh, you know, the diving stops at third base, the rocket for an arm, switch hit power, um, you know, the the Mexico series when he was battling, uh, you know, dehydration and uh, all these other issues and ends up getting IV fluid, you know, grabbing a Snickers bar and hitting two home runs. I mean, he was just a throwback. Um, the kind of the play, the kind of plays he made, the kind of player he was, he wasn't asking out of the lineup. He was always playing hurt. He was battling through so many injuries. I mean, the 96 season, he had a torn rotator cuff the first week of the season and ends up hitting 40 home runs and leading the Padres to the playoffs. I mean, just heroic stuff. And obviously you can look back now and say, yeah, he did this and he did that, but he would just, he was a fun player. And uh, as a fan of the nineties, you know, I think we missed out on some things because we didn't have that chance to watch streaming video. We couldn't always see these players play. So it was always sports center highlights, baseball cards, um, APA, uh, board game for me with my, with my family. It was like these little avenues into these fans that weren't in your network in your regional area, other than the all-star game in the world series in the playoffs. Um, so it was really neat to kind of see him play whenever you could. Um, and I just think he stood out to me, um, he stood up to me for his honesty. He showed in 2002 when he came forward to Sports Illustrated to yeah. talk about steroids, you know, and then I think when he died in 2004, it just really struck me. You know, a lot of times people pass away, you're like, oh, it's too bad. But like it kind of just lingered, you know, it was just like, why? Why did this happen? And yeah. I always felt like as a journalist, I felt like there was a book there. I felt like somebody should tell the story. And it got to the point where no one else had. And I said, you know, why not me? So I started researching and calling people and many, many years later, here we are. Yeah. By all accounts, uh, he, he was a very generous guy, uh, made a lot of trips to, to children's hospitals, yeah. uh, did a lot of things for charity, you know, while battling his own, obviously personal demons, uh, as many of us found out uh, more later than, than during as yet as you already uh, uh, alluded to, uh, was it hard to get, you know, uh, I've had authors on the show before and they talk about how difficult it is to get, you know, their book published and how many no's uh, they got before it finally, you know, could get it across the finish line uh, with it being Ken Kim and any, I know it's not your, your first book. So you, you have that a little bit of pedigree behind it. Was it, how difficult was it? being it was the, the, the subject was Ken Caminiti. That's a good question too. Um, you know, it, it's, it's layered because a lot of times with a book project and how I would book, uh, approach a book project today would be to get a deal in place and then write the book. And mm -hmm. for this book, because I didn't have experience at the time as a book writer and I didn't have as much journalism experience 
you know, we're talking a decade ago um, because I didn't have as much experience or name recognition or anything. I said, I'm just going to see if I can get a book. I'm going to see if I can even write this. I'm going to see if I can get people to talk to me. Um, so I only actually came forward to start trying to sell this project in 2019. Um, so I was working on it for seven years without a deal in place. And mm -hmm. in that time, I became a book ghostwriter. So I started writing books for other people and writing proposals for other people and kind of learning how the system works, which really did help me. Um, but I got a lot of a lot of rejections when I did start pitching this project. I got a lot of people saying, you know, the market's thinned over recent years. The sports book market isn't the same as it used to be. Um, I got people telling me that um, this doesn't have the broad interest. I had other people telling me that because he's not alive anymore, that there's not a marketable uh, connection to it. You know, you can't have an autograph signing for Ken to go sign copies of the book. It's not mm -hmm. like a situation like that. So it, it, there's all these other elements at play, social media uh, reach, uh, the number of followers you have, you know, it's all based on guaranteed sales. And because it's tough to put that on paper and say, I can sell you X number of copies of the book. You know, it was tougher to get the deal in place. Uh, it, it did take, uh, I want to say three or four months of pitching agents, you know, and then I finally did find my agent, uh, Joe Perry, and he's been great. And then I was able to work with him and he pitched to different publishers you know, and then we were able to find Abrams Press and it worked out. But, you know, the interesting thing I go back to is over the years I've seen, and I remember I saw a tweet by Jeff Perlman about this. This would have been like in 2015 or 2016. And someone actually asked him about a book about Ken Kennedy. And I'm like, I'm writing that book. But um, I saw this tweet and someone asked him about a book about him. And he's like, yeah, I don't think there's a market for that, <laughs> which is so frustrating because you're like, what is yeah. Why wouldn't there be a market? This this guy's life was so interesting, and there's so many areas of fascination around his life, both good and bad, and um, just an interesting person. And, you know, it is a shame, I think, today when you see um, books getting rejected or, you know, the the difficulty of getting a book published today is is really tough. But I just think there's so many good stories to tell. There's so many books to write, um, and I don't – I don't think people should get discouraged by the nose because I know I didn't by, by the time that I was getting rejected from agents and publishers, I'd already interviewed 250, 300 people. Um, so I knew I had a good book. It was just a matter of yeah. somebody saying, yes, we want to publish this, but it's a difficult process. It's really, it's really, uh, it can be maddening, but um, it's special when it, when it comes together. Yeah, and you, like you said, you've got a lot of years uh, invested uh, in this book. Were you were you nervous with putting that much time and effort into it? Like, it, it, I mean, obviously it's it's coming out here in April, but before that was sort of done and and signed, sealed, and delivered, so to speak. Were you nervous? Like, hey, I'm putting a lot of work into this thing, and I I really don't know if we'll ever see the light of day potentially. It was I mean, talk about like you know, the battle in your own mind with, you know, being so dedicated to getting it done, but just not knowing if, you know, it was going to be picked up, uh, so to speak. I think there has to be something deeper uh, within you that wants to do something like this. It can't just be, oh, I'm going to get paid because I have a deal. Yeah. I'll, I'll do this book. I think for me, it was a matter of knowing I had to do it right. You can't just do a book like this and kind of like go halfway or like, you know, weasel around it or like not really put the time in because the time is what matters. I mean, it's, it's getting the people to talk, it's finding the stories, it's digging deeper, digging beyond anything that you ever thought you could dig to, to find the story like this. And um, I, for me, I never looked at it like it wasn't worth the time because I knew the time would pay off just in the way it was, it was fruitful, but I just felt like there was more there was needed. And, and frankly, you could spend an entire lifetime on a book like this and never be completely done. Like there's, mm -hmm. there's never a point where like, I have every, every single thing I need, but you get to the point where you're like, okay, I have enough that I can publish and I feel good about this. But no, it, I mean, I hit a couple points where I kind of just had to put it aside for a little while. Uh, emotionally, it was overwhelming uh, at different points or you hit really tough 
uh, rejections or you get, um, you know, just difficulty or life gets in the way. Uh, you know, and like my, my son is born and I'm like, this is yeah. was strange because my son, it was great. My son was born. And like three weeks later was when the Padres were honoring Ken, um, with his hall of fame induction for the team. And I was like, I yeah. would love to go, but my son is three weeks old. Like I can't, I can't swing that. Um, which was, yeah. you know, the timing wasn't ideal for that, uh, event, but you know, it seemed that it was, you know, a great time for, for everybody there. But, um, you know, I just, you know, it's just the reality of it and, you know, you just kind of stick with it and see where it goes. But yeah, I mean, it's, there's ups and downs and, you know, there's times when life gets too busy where you can't devote the energy you want to it. And, and that's frustrating, but it's always kind of there. And for me, it was always kind of like, I need to go back to it. I need to keep working at it. And, you know, I'm just proud of, how it came together yeah when you when we think about ken caminiti the subject of this book i mean people forget like everyone thinks about the home runs the 96 mvp season obviously some of the bad things obviously are going to come uh to light uh but he was one heck of a, a defensive player as well one uh won multiple gold gloves people forget about that uh when it comes to the steroid era he was to to my knowledge and you can correct me he was really one of the first ones to sort of raise his hand and said, hey, I'm not proud of it. Uh, I did it. Uh, and really was very truthful. He didn't, you know, you hear guys say, oh, I tried it once or, you know, and I, I think they're not. They, they tell the truth, but I don't think they're telling the whole truth. Mm -hmm. um, and he came out and said, hey, I used it in my MVP season. I used it years uh, after that and uh, really kind of was the first one, uh, and I think there's something to that. I think, uh, you know, you, you, when you think of Rafael Palmeiro in Congress and pointing his finger back at Congress saying, mm -hmm. I didn't do this, and it really came out later that that wasn't the case for a guy to not really under that kind of scrutiny to, to come clean on that in, in front of Congress just to say, hey, look, this, this happened. Uh, I did it. Uh, I'm not really proud of it. Uh, I got some things going on, um, you know, and, um, you know, I think there's something to be said about someone who kind of, you know, yeah, he did it, but to, to be honest about it uh, and, and, and sort of be, put himself out there knowing that he was going to take some shots. You know, there's going to be people that say, you know, take that MVP uh, trophy award. Oh, oh, way. Uh, it didn't, thankfully it didn't happen. You know, I don't think it should. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's something to be said about that. Yeah. I think that was a really important part of his disclosure in 2002, because it came at the same time that Jose Canseco was starting to come forward and talk about this book that he was writing that came out in 2005. That was explosive in its own right. Um, but he had an axe to grind. Jose Canseco did. Ken didn't. Ken wasn't yeah. trying to burn bridges. He didn't name names. He didn't throw any of his teammates under the bus. Um, he was simply trying to share his own truth. And, you know, he was uh, coming out of rehab uh, for addiction issues at that point in time, you know, and trying to keep his life clean and trying to, um, to be open and honest. And uh, for him to admit to that as clearly and as vocally as he did, I think meant so much to the game. He, you know, his fellow players, some of them came out and were really critical. You know, he's a rat, he's a snitch, all these other things. Um, but when you look back and you're exactly right, I mean, some of the other players who've been forced to come forward and admit to use have all said, it didn't help me. It didn't do this. It didn't do that. I only used it for a little while. Um, most of the time that's not true. I mean, yes, some of them, um, it, and it really, there's a range of reasons for players who use steroids in that era. A lot of them were trying to hang on. I think in Ken's case, it was a, a way of him keeping up his level of play. You know, after in 1995, 1996, he's 32, 33 is on the wrong side of 30. His body isn't responding the way it used to. Um, you know, he really wants to maintain his level of play. And that's when he started turning to them, you know, and this had been something that he had considered doing earlier in his career. You know, he was uh, offered steroids or research steroids in the early nineties and didn't use them at the time because he was still performing at a high level. 
you know, when you start to decline a little bit, that's when you start to wonder, you know, how can it help me to hang on? You know, so I look at some of these guys who are using it for uh, rehab purposes to get back from an injury. They're the 25th guy in the roster and they're trying to stay on the team to make that, uh, that paycheck, to make that salary, to provide for their family. Um, you know, obviously the Barry Bonds is and Roger Clemens is and Alex Rodriguez get a lot of the attention, but it's all those other guys, the middle relievers, the, the last guys on the really? roster, like, you know, people can argue that they're cheating the game, but there, there were no, there were no testing policies in place at the time. There was a piece of paper saying these are, these are banned, but no one was doing anything about it. Uh, but for him to come forward and to admit to it the way he did blew the lid open on uh, baseball's innocence. It blew the lid open on the entire performance enhancing era. Uh, the McGuire Sosa, the Barry Bonds is the Roger Clemens is, I think it forced us as fans to finally um, be critical of what we were seeing and say, is this actually real? Did this happen uh, the way we think it is? Is this innocent? You know, you go back and look at the glowing magazine profiles and TV pieces about the Maguires and the Sosas from 98. And it's so like laughable now, you know, yeah. say, <laughs> you know, well, you know, the, um, the bottle was found in Mark McGuire's locker and, you know, it was the reporter who was blasted, not McGuire himself, yeah. you know, who was using yeah. performance enhancing drugs at the time that were not allowed in the Olympics. Um, but I think the, the other thing about that era, too, is that was the time when um, different supplements started to come to use, you know, creatine and other ones. So it, yeah. there was such a blurry line where people were using creatine, people were using steroids. Um, but... It, a lot of them, they knew what they were doing. I'm not saying that they were fully aware of things. And I don't think Ken was as aware of things as he needed to be at times. But, uh, you know, they knew what they were doing. They knew that these things helped them. You look at the power numbers that they were putting up and you say, where did this come from? This guy never hit this many home runs before at any level of professional baseball. And now he's hitting 40 and 50. Like, yeah, that's suspect. Um, but yeah. You know, I, I think that Ken's disclosure in 2002 was massive and, um, you know, he paid a big price for it. There was a lot of people who blasted them for it. But ultimately, you know, all these years later, I think we can look back in appreciation for what he did, because there have been very few players who have come forward honestly in the way that he has. And, um, you know, I think that it really stands out. Yeah, I agree. And the ones that have, Dan, really only did, do uh, almost when they're backed in the corner. Mm -hmm. And they have no other choice. They're almost, it's like they're really caught. And then they try to, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to say belittle it, but they try to justify why they did it and why they didn't say nothing uh, yeah. for so long. You know, uh, Ken didn't do that. He kind of came clean. Sure, the, some others didn't like it uh, because they wanted it to be, you know, baseball's dark secret for, for longer uh, than it wound up uh, being. And, uh, I, you know, I, I, I don't condone the usage, but sure. I did respect the fact that without a, a lot of pressure, he just kind of said, hey, this I did this. Uh, it's not good. And here's a little bit why. And, you know, he you know what, what a lot of players did, like I said, was they I think they also even when they admitted to it, I think they lied about how long they did oh, yeah. it for. And oh, yeah. I, I didn't get the impression with him. And, and you know, the sad part was, like, he, he battled some drug addiction. And I, I believe had he beaten that, uh, ultimately, I think he would have, you know, done a lot of great things off the field post-career in helping other people uh, battle their own uh, addictions and demons. And it's just sad, uh, unfortunately, that wasn't uh, uh, to be. Uh, you know, passing away in, in 2004. But had that not happened, he got clean and sober. I think he would have been there from from all everything I've heard about him. You know, even even being a user and some of these other demons, you know, a lot of stories you hear about about how generous and giving and unselfish he was. And so, uh, I think had he gotten past that, uh, he would have been an advocate to help others uh, try to get past. Uh, some of those issues uh, themselves. It's just, you know, it's a shame, uh, you know, he, he, he didn't get that opportunity. Uh, Self-inflicted, but it's still it's still sad, just uh, the same. And, uh, you know, 
Uh, you said you spoke to, you know, over 250 uh, people, you know, associated or affiliated uh, with Ken Caminiti in, in the writing of the book. Were, were most people willing to kind of share their stories uh, uh, about yeah. him? It ended up being about 400 people I spoke to. Wow. Um, yeah, it. Um, most people did talk to me. I mean, there were some people close to him that didn't want to talk, and I certainly respected that. But, um, you know, got to talk to Bruce Bochy. I cold called him, and he called me back. Uh, I, I cold called Bobby Cox and talked to him uh, four or five years ago. Um, Greg Vaughn, Luis Gonzalez, um, you know, a lot, a lot of players from the 90s. Um, it's just neat because, you know, even players like Walt Weiss is a good example. Uh, Walt Weiss was on the Braves in 99 and they played against the Astros in the playoffs. And there was a play that Walt Weiss made that saved this, this game for the, the Braves. He was diving, bases loaded. Tony Eusebio was batting for the Astros and Walt Weiss dove. And he had to dive almost backwards, like toward the outfield to get this ball. And he threw home and he got Ken out at home and the Braves ended up winning that game. They won the series and after the game, um, Ken called, Walt Weiss was in the clubhouse and he gets a phone call and it's from Ken. And Ken's like, I'm so mad that you beat us, but that was like the best freaking play I've ever seen. Yeah. I just want you to know that. It's those little types of things that stand out to me the most, um, you know, from the fellow players that I talked to of Ken's, um, you know, Billy Wagner was, uh, you know, he kind of took Billy Wagner under his wing when he was with the Astros. Um, you know, and going back even to the earlier years with like Billy Doran, Kevin Bass, and those those Astros teams of the 80s, it just, it's been really interesting to, to learn about his playing days. It's been interesting to learn about his past, you know, calling his high school friends, his college friends, you know, and just kind of learning how he became who he became and um, the warm, generous person he is. You you alluded to it, but I mean, there was a situation in 1997 with the Padres, and they had uh, a really close fan of theirs, uh, Cindy Mathers, who had passed away of cancer, and the Padres wanted to do something to raise money for um, in her name, and uh, one of the uh, community representatives for the Padres was going around talking to the players and seeing what they wanted to do. And she approached Ken and it was close to game time. And he had that stoic, like, you know, didn't say much. She was really like, he looked disgruntled. He looked angry. And she was like explaining to him what she wanted to do. Uh, and if there was anything that he could think of that he was, you know, going to do to help this thing. And he didn't say much. And she was like, he's probably just mad. He doesn't want to be bothered. And she was around the next day. And he actually came up to her and was like, I'd like to donate my motorcycle uh, to help wow. for this fundraiser. And it was interesting because she thought he was mad at the time, but he was actually just thinking about it. You know, sometimes he's yeah. had to think about things and there's so many little instances like that of him going out of his way to help people of making his teammates feel welcome. There were so many guys that he took under his wing, uh, even going back to Phil Nevin. So Phil Nevin was the number one pick in the 92 draft the Astros could have picked that Derek Jeter guy from the shortstop from Michigan. <laughs> they didn't pick him. They picked Phil Nevin instead, who had a really nice career and is, you know, a yeah. really good coach. But, um, you know, they uh, – and Phil Nevin's a third baseman. So they have Ken Caminiti at third base. Now you have Phil Nevin, who's going to be the guy down the road. And most players in Ken's shoes would have said, screw this guy. I'm not helping yeah. him. Ken instead says, I'm going to invite him to my house in the offseason – and work out with him for a couple of weeks and show him the ropes on what it means to be a major league player. Basically saying, if you're going to take my job, you're going to do it the right way. And the same thing he did with Jeff Bagwell in 1991, when the Astros traded um, for the Red Sox, uh, Larry Anderson to the Red Sox for Jeff Bagwell. And Jeff Bagwell is a third baseman. Here's a guy who's in line to take Ken's job. And uh, the same thing, like Ken, you know, uh, put up a great competition, obviously, and Jeff Bagwell had a good spring, and the other third baseman they they camp at the, that year, Luis Gonzalez, had a good spring, and Art Howe decided, hey, I'm going to move Jeff Bagwell to first base, and I'm going to move Luis Gonzalez to left field, and I'm going to keep Ken at third. Um, but he was just he was an awesome teammate like that. You know, he was always going out of his way to help people, and um, you know, I think those 
those good things shine through, you know, his, his good heart shines through, even though, you know, he was battling some things internally, there were so many good things that he was doing. And, and, you know, I think those positive things really, uh, you know, outweigh everything else that was going on with his life. Yeah, no, no doubt. Now, did you, did you yourself uh, have any kind of um, interactions with him while he was, during his playing days? No, I wish I had. I, I was really disappointed. I was kind of going back into this and thinking about it, but I haven't. Um, I Every time I went to see his, his teams play, he wasn't playing or he was hurt. Um, so I'd seen the Astros play around the time he was on the team. I got Jeff Bagwell's autograph. Uh, I met Greg Vaughn. I got his autograph. I saw the Padres play the year after he left in 99. Because uh, I grew up in Pennsylvania, so it was kind of like the Phillies or the Orioles that I would go and see. And yeah. uh, I never saw him play live, um, which is disappointing. But I saw a lot of players who he interacted with and always appreciated those guys. And um, and that's been kind of neat, too, kind of going down these childhood paths and be like, oh, I, you know, I got Greg Vaughn's autograph at a game, a Reds game in 1999. Here I am talking to him on the phone, um, yeah. you know, but it, it just, it, it's, I, I always wish I would have been able to interact with him. And, um, and it's, you know, it's one of those things that you think about, but, um, and even the, the Rangers in 2001, uh, he had been released by the time uh, I got to see them. They're my favorite team. Um, yeah. So, uh, sadly, but um, he wasn't on the team when they uh, when they played in uh, Baltimore. But uh, just I just missed him like a couple different times. Yeah, but you're probably in, in writing to this book and and talking into talking to that many people who who know him. You almost probably uh, at this point almost feel like you've gotten to know him through the writing of the book and talking to other people. Uh, who knew knew him so well? Oh yeah, yeah. You kind of you walk around in their shoes, and you kind of see how they see the world, and see how they react to things, and even just the quotes he gave. You know, after different performances, you know, after the World Series game one in 1998, he was in the the clubhouse after the game and got interviewed, and he was just like so deflated. Padres had lost, and you could just see it on his face. So you're like, or other times in '96, you can see when he's getting animated in interviews. Uh, when he's really engaged, or like his hands are moving a certain way, uh, there's just little things that you, you 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 walk around with somebody's story and ideas in mind for so long, and you start like picking up little pieces, uh, little clues, and it's interesting to 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 bring that all together, and you know, and look at the world through their eyes, you know, and and understand and appreciate things that you didn't before. Yeah, sure, it's going to be a great read. That's April. It's coming up here. Uh, in April of 2022, and uh, uh, you know, one thing I want to stress, you know, I'm not a fan of of the players using uh, steroids. Uh, I, I think it's wrong, but you know, these guys are humans. Uh, there's more to them than just the player on the field as well. I think without seeing this book or reading it yet, obviously, I think that's going to come out. Uh, it sounds like, and uh, I think that's important uh, as well. These are these are human beings. Uh, besides uh, incredible athletes. And uh, uh, I think that story uh, needs to be told. And I'm, I'm glad uh, you're doing that, uh, Dan, and look forward to uh, to reading it uh, in April, probably along with many others uh, as well. Thank you so much. All right. So this is a, a card show, uh, but I definitely <laughs> wanted, I definitely wanted to talk about that. Listen, Ken's been on plenty of cards uh, yeah. as well. Uh, so, Kind of speak to your collecting uh, interest uh, as a card collector, and 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 just kind of the segue from writing this book. Did you become like? Did you kind of seek out any Caminiti cards? I mean, to be honest with you, they're not crazy expensive. That's this one is. Old. This one yep. is. So this is the 1985 Osceola Astros team issue. Wow. Uh, they gave this away to fans. There weren't that many fans that showed up. And this, this card is hard to find. I was on eBay for years, every single day, probably for five or six years until one popped up. And it happened to be the highest graded one. Uh, it's a 9.5 Beckett grade, and the signature is a 9. These yeah. things, I, I, there might be 100 or 200 that exist. Yeah. I mean, they, they were given away. At, they, you know, they were at the stadium, and this was in, you know, 85. And 
Um, you know, the players have these cards and a couple fans do, but the fans weren't showing up. So uh, yeah. I was really happy to, to get one. But no, I mean, it's neat to see the cards. It's neat to appreciate those cards. I mean, I became a collector in the 90s. Um, I really became a collector in starting in 93. Uh, I was given a pack of 93 Upper Deck and it was a jumbo pack. And I opened up yeah. and there was uh, Upper Deck then and now Nolan Ryan in there. And yep. it was right around the same time I'd read a newspaper article about Nolan. It was his last season. It was like really exciting. And I was like, this guy's awesome. Um, so I, you know, started collecting cards from there. And, you know, it's been really interesting kind of, you know, being in the hobby through the 90s, early 2000s, kind of leaving a little bit, you know, go to college, start your career. You don't have any money, so you can't buy cards. And then yep. you kind of get back into it. And you're like, wow, this has changed. This is a little bit different yeah. than what I'm used to. <laughs> and now it's expensive and so you don't have any money but you have some cards <laughs> but uh <laughs> I'm, I'm i'm half kidding but uh uh yeah i mean it's 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 crazy where how things can can change i'm assuming uh with that pulling that ryan out of that 93 upper deck uh, jumbo pack that's where the the ranger fandom kind of started yeah. that's where it started it was it was that, and then it was no. It was Juan Gonzalez in the home run derby. He won that year, and it was yeah. like that, that. Those two things, and then they had the new stadium and the new uh, uniforms and logo. And I was like, I was so hooked. Kenny Rogers, perfect game, like yeah. such a good team, and like, and that really just struck it for me. And it was just, you know, I kind of just wanted to find my own team because my dad was a Phillies fan, my mom was a Reds fan from the Big Red Machine, and yeah, you know, I like the Reds, but like. I wanted to find my own team and here's the Rangers and no one's a Rangers fan that I know. So it was kind of, kind of neat to embrace yeah. that and uh, you know, appreciate that and collect as many Rangers cards as I could. Yeah. I'm, I'm a, I'm a New York city kid from Brooklyn. Uh, I, I was a Yankee fan when I was very young and then Steinbrenner sort of ruined it for me with like sure. trading guys left and right, signing guys left and right. So I became a Mets fan. Uh, when they were losing 110 games a year. So no one could say I jumped on like a, a winning bandwagon. And then for football, you know, for football, for me, I've told the story on the show before. Um, I was a Steeler fan. I took a lot of heat from my friends growing up in New York. Like, how are you a Steelers fan? You're in New York City. We got the Jets. We got the Giants. I said, I just don't like the Jets and Giants. And I just love the, the color uniform. I was a big mean Joe Green yeah. Uh, guy, and if you remember the Coke commercial, came out oh, yeah. uh, 1977, 78, where the, you know, for those that don't remember, you know, a kid uh, has a Coke, a, a kid that was actually my age at the same time, uh, and gives Mean Joe the Coke, and Mean Joe has his jersey draped over his shoulder, and says, "Hey, kid," throws the, the jersey to the kid, and just number one commercial of all time when they do they do those shows are for marketing and number one commercial and i saw i had a resemblance besides being the same age as that kid i looked like that kid and so i sort of vicariously became <laughs> that kid and it was a big you know seeing that big mean joe green and actually do something nice i became a, a mean joe and a, a Steeler fan uh yes they were winning then so i can't I can't say the same thing with my Mets fandom. I did kind of <laughs> jump on, but it really wasn't so much the Super Bowls as it was that commercial and Mean Joe. Sure. And uh, you know, I took a lot of heat at, at first uh, from friends, but uh, I stuck with them from the age of six or seven. I'm, I'm 48 now. Uh, wow. We usually get to Pittsburgh once or twice a year uh, under normal circumstances. Uh, uh, for for some Steeler games and uh, you know it's that's funny I love asking you uh, uh, those that come on sort of where the fandom starts for for you it was that Ryan coming out of that pack and for me it's the Coke commercial with Mean Joe and the Steelers it's those stories that are just sometimes so interesting when you even think about it had that been maybe a different card you might be a fan of a different team you mm -hmm. know. So had had Coke decided to, you know, hire a different athlete, maybe I might not be a Steeler fan. I might be who knows what what team at, at that point. So exactly. uh, I just love those stories. Like, how did you become a fan? Especially if it's 
a team that's like in a different state or, or not necessarily yeah. close, you know. I mean, yeah. a lot of times, obviously, uh, you make a great point. A lot of times we're sort of uh, indoctrinated and, in, you know, whatever our parents or fans of, we sort of get, uh, you know, we have to be, you're automatically a fan of that team. Or if you live in that city uh, and that's the home team, you sort of uh, by location. And so especially when it's a team that maybe, you know, like you said, you're from Pennsylvania but yet you're a Ranger fan. It's always interesting to hear how that all comes into play. And uh, uh, there you go. And it's just a pull of a card, really, in your case, and uh, of a Hall of Famer, no doubt. But uh, yeah. still, the, the fact that that's what uh, started it all. So today, where do your collecting interests lie? What what kind of stuff do you, do you like to collect and, and, and acquire? It's still Ranger stuff, um, and it, it goes all over the place. I love, like, just the variety of it all. Um, I really got into Dixie Lids uh, over the past couple years from, like, the, the 50s. Um, yeah. They had them through, like, the 30s to the 50s, but, like, 52 to 54 had baseball players on them, and there's hundreds of different variations of the ice cream companies on the back. It's, like, little things like that. Um, a big Bobby Shantz fan. Um, there's just so many like different things I get into, but, um, I would say still Rangers, mostly, um, 1990s stuff, um, which the frustrating thing, interesting and frustrating is that, you know, over the past decade, I've been consistently buying up like junk wax from the nineties and just opening it because I like, opening yeah. it. you know, and you might get like a box of like 96 finest for like 50 bucks or 75 bucks. And now this stuff is <laughs> exorbitantly priced. It's all gone up. And I'm like, this is my stuff. <laughs> this is the stuff I always buy. And I can't find yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it's funny because uh, I grew up in that era too. I was born in 72. My first pack was 79 tops. And oh. uh, even to find, like you said, that 90 stuff. Now everyone's trying to go back and, and reacquire it. And it's, it's the, de- you know, I think the demand is sort of overmatching. Uh, the supply and we all know uh, you don't have to be an economics major to figure out uh, when that happens the price is obviously going to go up i mean it's not crazy but it's not as cheap as we uh, once remember it and uh, but like you said it's still fun that sort of uh, nostalgia go back and and open that stuff up and sort of you know the smell i mean i even talk uh-huh. about the smells of the car that it sounds weird, but it's true that uh-huh. bring you back to your, your childhood and uh, a day, you know, of innocence. I always joke, you know, uh, during those times, you know, no bills, nothing, nothing too crazy uh, to worry about. And uh, uh, it's nice to go back there and uh, you can't go back for real. You know, I always joke uh, that the DeLorean and Back to the Future is just a movie. It'd be <laughs> nice if it really was true, but yeah. uh, you know, uh, so the closest thing you can get is opening the packs from that era, uh, the smells, and it just reminisce and, and take you back. Even if it's for just a few moments, uh, it's worth it. And uh, I do it too, and it's it's fun. And, uh, you know, one, some of my favorite, uh, I was 17 at the time, but opening up some of the packs from 89 with the Griffey oh. rookies. Oh, uh, yeah. And I think that's where it began. Uh, for a lot of a lot of people, the Griffey rookie chase, especially on the upper deck side of things, and uh, you know, but uh, it's those things that will we'll always can go back to how we first got into cards or certain years we remember and why. And you know, '85 Donruss uh, was a, a big set for me. Just I love mm. the design. Uh, Manly Winfield had a, a lot of cards. That was the the batting race uh, the, the year before. You know that was the batting race year. Yeah. Uh, I was in New York still, and so uh, uh, at that point, I, I was I was more of a Mets fan, but I was Manly was still one of my favorite players. Uh, I just you know Steinbrenner had kind of ruined it uh, for me at that point, but I still respected Donnie baseball, the way he played. And, uh, sure. you know, so it's, it, you just think about certain years and designs of cards and, and, and opening more, let's say for, for, for those reasons, uh, and whatnot. So do you open a lot of current stuff? I know we talked about some of the, you know, the, the, the older junk wax, as you say, do you get to open much of the, the current stuff? 
Yeah, I mean, I would say so. Um, probably every month or so. Um, yeah. Obviously, my wife Suze is like really into uh, current cards, and yeah, it's interesting being able to collect and appreciate it through her eyes and like understanding how the sets are put together and the composition of it all. I mean, we were just opening uh, Tops Update uh, the other day. You know, I'm I'm trying to stay up on it as much as possible. And it's, I mean, it's obviously there's supply chain issues going on this year that make things difficult. And there's other complexities and difficulties yeah. and, you know, um, uh, big deals going on that are <laughs> very <laughs> difficult to keep track but uh no it's i mean it's still at the end of the day it's still you're opening cards you know you never know what you're going to find inside it's that rush the excitement the unknown yeah. you know maybe this guy will be the next big thing that's been interesting too going back and looking at all these cards that we've opened over the past decade or so and finding so many cards that you didn't know you had finding guys who became good even like uh cedric mullins you know he has a break yeah. season. like oh i have a you know, Bowman Chrome of him. Like, yeah. you know, it's just neat to be able to go back and say like, oh, I actually have cards of these guys because when you're pulling them from packs as rookies or as prospects, a lot of times you don't know who they are. You don't know who they're going to become. Uh, so it's really neat to be able to say, I have this when you didn't even know yeah. you had it. But um, no, I mean, yeah, I'm still, I still, you know, stay up on current stuff and uh, open current stuff pretty regularly. Uh, is there any, yeah. any current products that you really like? Uh, I try to open a little bit of everything. You you made a point earlier, you know, with, with some of the prices, it's it's hard to open. I open a lot less now, believe it or not, than than I used to. I just sort of learned uh, you know, trial and error that you know you <laughs> you, you you usually come out on the loop. It's fun, it's fun as heck in the process, and then sort of when the smoke clears and the dust settles, you realize like, wow, I didn't really <laughs> get I didn't get my values. Uh, worth. It's funny you mentioned, uh, Dan, it's funny you mentioned Cedric Mullins. It's a funny story here, or at least to me. Uh, I'm going to maybe find it funny than, than some other. W whenever I've had open stuff in the last few years, I'm like a Cedric Mullins magnet. I was just er pulling <laughs> Cedric Mullins stuff. And at the time, he kind of struggled. He had he a year, yeah. he had him like 163. And so when I was getting them, I mean, with all due respect to Cedric Mullins, I'm like, oh, man, Cedric Mullins. <laughs> and now it's funny when I heard you say, yeah, you know, you pull this out. Like, yeah, like we're 30-30 season. And, uh, you know, like now I'm pulling all those Mullins. I just have kind of – I keep – I'm really organized. So, like, all my Mullins is – I didn't have to, like, look in a million different boxes. to pull. They were all together, but the pulling them out, I'm like, these turned out to be not terrible – uh, yeah. In the grand scheme of things, and that's the that's the one fun thing about baseball is you know uh, from one year to the next, the guy can can you know jumpstart his career. Uh, it's also fun to buy somebody uh, like that. You know, you look at a guy like uh, Luis Robert this uh, last mm -hmm. year got hurt. A lot of you know, it amazes me when a guy gets hurt. How many people like jump ship like they're never going to come back and yeah. play baseball again if it's not a career ending injury. It's something they can come back and play, and uh, you know they—he's a guy I think is going to be a, a, a very good player. And so yeah. I bought some when people were kind of dumping them and and getting rid of them cheap. I said, "Hey, the guy's injured, but he's going to play again. And if someone's <laughs> going to give up uh, at the drop of a dime like that, uh, I'll take a flyer in that in those kind of situations." And he came back this year and played actually pretty well. So we'll yeah. see. You know, again, he could, you know, anything can happen on any given know. day, God forbid. So you're right. You, you, you never know. You mentioned, uh, you know, you're, you're married to Sue. So, yeah, you, you know, everyone in, in the hobby is very familiar and she's, she's a, a hobby icon and, uh, you know, done a lot of great things for the hobby. You, even if you didn't like cards, you, 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 you'd be indoctrinated, you know, talk about indoctrinated, you, you'd be, uh, to, you know, uh, how is that? Do you have like debates in, in at home about players or sets or, or, or hobby? I think, yeah, it's a, re it's a really good question. I think we both have different interest in it. Um, you know, and it's, it's been interesting to see those things offset. You know, when I came in, we started dating, like I was still into the common cards and 90s stuff and like going yeah. back and opening 
you know, 92 score and finding cool things in there. Um, you know, and, and she was more into the current stuff, the modern stuff and the big hits, you know, yeah. and, and I was never into big hits uh, in collecting. And then when you, open a lot of boxes of modern stuff, you get excited about the big hits and you're like, wow, this is great. Um, so it's been interesting to kind of like pair those two interests and recognize and appreciate, you know, the, the things that she's collecting and she respects and appreciates the things that I'm collecting. And like, I look out for Yankees players for her and she looks out for Rangers players for me. And um, there's so much, um, there's so much to collect. There's so much out there. And it's interesting to, the other thing too for her is like uh, during her time at Tops, like being able to understand like kind of behind the curtain, like what's actually happening. How yeah. how's this put together? Um, one of the coolest things was when because she was the editor on 2017 Stadium Club, and you know she was do, picking all the pictures, and she's like, "Do you want to help me pick some pictures?" So like, there you go. I picked pictures for like <laughs> 2017 Stadium Club, which was awesome and i'm like oh i picked this picture like the lou gear yeah. is like i picked that picture you know and i found That's out cool. later that there was a there was a set that came out in like 2002 or 2001 that used the same picture like it's one of those things that like i, I may have even seen the original and not even realized it and like not yes. connected to that. um you know it wasn't some of these repeats you see like one year to the next and you're like oh that's kind of that's kind of weak, but, uh, <laughs> but in any event, it just, it's really neat to collect through other people's eyes and to like appreciate different things and like she'll get into different players and like, Oh, it's like, Oh, Anthony Rizzo's on the Yankees. So I want to get something of him or, you know, um, yeah. some of the big prospects coming up from the Yankees. So it's, it's really neat to kind of see the hobby through different levels and then like see her Jeter collection. Like she's yeah. like, yeah. super into Jeter. I'm like, <laughs> Jeter, obviously I have a lot of Jeter cards just from collecting, but like he was never a guy I looked out for. Um, yeah. And there's so many like variations. There's so many uh, minor league products he was in. There's so many, you yeah. know, uh, hard to find rare items from like the early part of his career that you're never going to find because no one sells them. Um, but there's just, it's really neat to to look at the the hobby through different different eyes and different levels and, and appreciate it uh, anew. Yeah. So I don't want to misquote you here. So what you're saying is you were the, the, the magic behind some of these tops releases <laughs> and not Susan. <laughs> I would say that I helped. She's the one who signed off on the final, um, final things, but I, yeah. I helped pick a couple of the pictures. <laughs> no, that's cool. That's very cool. And I, how many people get to say they, they had a little bit of a small part in, in something like that. So uh, very, very cool. So segue and coming down the stretch here, uh, you know, tops for me for being a Brooklyn kid, uh, tops was born in Brooklyn. I was born in Brooklyn a, a few years later, let's just say, but from a very early age, like, it was tops and uh, 70 years of, of history. Uh, you alluded to some of the recent news with, with fanatics uh, getting awarded uh, the license here uh, in a few years. When that news uh, came across my phone, Dan, uh, the Brooklyn kid in me that my heart uh, sank a little bit. Uh, yeah. I'm not saying, I'm not saying tops isn't a little bit culpable in the loss of the license, but when someone's done something for 70 years, and there's a chance that that's the end. I don't care who you are, uh, but even more so, I think uh, being in the hobby, doing content creation, being from Brooklyn, it really, really struck a chord, uh, a sad chord to me that we might not see those five letters on a baseball card, uh, at least for a while. Uh, the, yeah. the word is it's a 20 year deal that Fanatics now has. Um, you know, we don't know. There's a lot of unknowns. We're a couple years away from anything of, of substance being produced. You know, Tops could sell to Fanatics potentially. There could be some sort of deal to use Tops branding and, and keep some of these brands or lines alive under the Fanatics rule, if you will. So we don't know uh, officially how this is all going to sh shake out. But, you know, assuming that Fanatics says, hey, we, it's our license. We don't need your tops. We're going to do our own thing. Thank you. know, thanks for 70 years. But we'll take it from here. If that's the way it goes, you know, someone like myself and I think many others, 
it's going to be a sort of a sad day. Uh, I hope uh, Tops lives on in some form or fashion. I, I, I hope cooler heads prevail and, and even Fanatics realizes the importance of 70 years. I know they won the license and, and they want to, you know, to the victor goes the spoils, uh, as they say. But I just hope there's some sort of olive branch to collectors where Tops has that meaning to them. Um, sort of your thoughts as someone who has, you know, that uh, a little bit of that inside uh, look and, and knows uh, about Tops from from the way you do and, and being married to, to Sue's and, and, and even besides that, just being into cards and collecting, you know, what, what when you heard that news, like what were some of your early thoughts uh, at the time? I, I, it's the same as you, in a way, it was just shock. You're like, how yep. is this possible? You know, you, you try to run it through your head and it just doesn't register. You're like, Tops is baseball cards. This is how yep. it's been since 1951. 1952 was the first flagship set. Like, this yep. is massive seismic shifts in the hobby. And, and, you know, it changes the entire game. It changes every single thing that we know about collecting and collecting cards in the way that we do. Um, I will say this, though. Um, it, you know, I think that um, it's disappointing to see the direction that everything's taken in general. And I don't even say that about just the tops license. I say that about everything else. You look back in the 90s and early 2000s, there was so much innovation in the hobby. There were so many different companies involved. And obviously, some of them did not work and did not last. Um, yeah. But, you know, there was so much innovation, so many ideas and so many fresh new things, you know, Chrome, Finest, Game Use stuff, parallel uh, cards, um, you know, autographs and packs. I mean, all these things happened over the course of about a decade, um, you know, and then you look at everything is kind of chasing that, chasing after that, um, you know, and there's new things that come out. But, you know, they're kind of like derivative and building off of stuff that we've already seen before. Um, but Going back to that, you know, the deal in place and what what Fanatics does next, you know, I think you look at some of the other situations like this that have emerged, uh, like Panini, for example. You know, Panini had to acquire brands and property to be able to, to make products. I don't see how Fanatics, and this is just my own speculation, this is not based on yeah. anything. I don't, I don't see how Fanatics could create cards, create card sets, create card products and not by some company that already exists and the brands that they have, because otherwise yeah. every single thing you create is going to be somehow connected to something that's already been made before. So there's a lawsuit, there's a lawsuit, there's a lawsuit. Um, yeah. You know, how can you create a chromium product if you're not chrome or prism? You know, it's really tough to find a narrow yeah. area where this is unique and new and different uh, when these other companies have been doing it before and these brands are very popular, um, you know, and, and you look at the deal and it's like you look at something like Prism that's really finding its footing and like popular and like coming into its own. You're like, oh, this is frustrating. Like I was really interested to see what comes out next. Um, yeah. but, but going back to this, like I really do think I would love to see Tops connected to this if Fanatics ends up buying the Tops license and can create tops products under its umbrella that would be great yeah. if they you know want to work with panini like they're gonna have to work with somebody they can't just create a card company out of thin air and have no licenses and no brands and create a range of products that people are going to love i mean that would take years and years and years and i don't know how it would work um but if you buy a tops or you buy the properties and are able to put out brands that Tops has made and that people already love, that would, I think, go a long way to bridging the gap for collectors like ourselves who have been in this hobby for a long time. I think it would be very tough for fanatics to win us over if they don't have something that we already hold near and dear to us and they're just creating something completely new. Um, you know, but I, I think the model, um, you know, it's kind of scary. It's kind of scary looking at, um, you know, the potential changes that could happen. Uh, it's kind of scary at the, the model being disrupted. Uh, I don't like that much change. I'm not a big mm -hmm. person. I'm not a big proponent for change that way. Um, but obviously the world's changing and um, I'm hopeful that um, whatever form this takes in the future will 
incorporate the best parts of the hobby now, even if it's a little bit different than what we're used to. But I would love if um, some of these, you know, iconic brands like Tops um, would be involved in this process and not on the outside looking in and not completely boxed out and pushed away from the hobby. Because as you said, like Tops and the hobby are, you know, synonymous. This is Tops baseball is the leading brand in the hobby for the past 70 years. It's really tough to just yep. erase that and start something new when this is what drew pretty much all of us into this in the first place. So I'm hopeful that, uh, you know, 2024, 2025, 2026, we can see tops products that we can, you know, uh, figure out this whole licensing thing. We can see, you know, uh, really proper tops releases you know, you like Heritage is a good example. You are already going to yeah. stop at 75, like you're going to be done there and that's it. Like there's so yeah. many years. I really want to see Tops Heritage up. So it's yeah. you know, really important for this to keep going because uh, there's so much, there's so much that uh, we hold near and dear about Tops and I don't want to see it out of the hobby. It would, it would be a disservice for everybody. Yeah, we are waving the same pennant and rooting for the same thing uh here i hope you know cooler heads prevail i hope fanatics realizes uh you know tops didn't do everything perfect we understand that sure. uh, but 70 years of history they did a lot of things right uh, mm -hmm. too and people uh fell in love with baseball cards uh in, in tops's case and in other sports but well uh, you know recently the just baseball cards and uh, i hope they sort of send them an olive branch, like you said, uh, to us collectors to say, hey, we realize it's important to you. Uh, one thing that was encouraging, I don't want to, you know, we, we kind of got to wrap it up, but uh, uh, Michael Rubin, the CEO, uh, on a recent interview, when he was asked uh, uh, any potential to buy an existing uh, card manufacturer, he said most likely. So that's encouraging. Uh, the fact that he didn't say either duck the question or say no, probably not, or or something along. No, we're gonna we're gonna do our own thing to to say most likely when he didn't have to uh, no. is is encouraging uh, and uh, hopefully uh, that's that's what happens. Uh, you know, we'll have to we'll have to kind of cross our fingers and uh, see how this all plays out. And it's we're gonna be you know it's amazing how much I've talked about it on this show and yet to talk about it. And like you said. We're a few years away from seeing anything uh, of substance uh, from the new agreements, and but uh, that's what we love to do uh, in content creation, and we like to speculate. That's that's all we can do right now is just kind of give educated guesses. Some of it, uh, I think, in both of our cases, what we've said on this episode is a little bit of uh, wishful hoping and thinking to see yeah. those five uh, in Tops's case to see those. Uh, those brands kind of continue on uh, and those legacies uh, not end. And uh, I'm hopeful that, you know, maybe not everything, but uh, some of the, you know, you mentioned one heritage, which believe it or not, I'm not a big fan of, but I realize, but at the same time, and I realize the importance of that line, uh, yeah. just because I don't particularly uh, like it doesn't mean that it's not a huge thing that needs to, to continue uh, on and uh, hopefully something tells me and again I don't want jinx now something tells me something's going to to give and I, I hope that's uh, uh, that's the case. I want to thank you for for giving the show some time uh, talking about uh, your book coming out. Uh, that's in April of 2022. Uh, it's called uh, what Ken Caminiti playing through the pain. Uh, you, you know maybe we'll have you back on too closer to. Uh, release and we'll 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 get the, the word out there uh, again. I always give our guests here on Sports Card Nation kind of the the final word. Give out any websites, social media handles, whatever you want to share with those listening, where they can find uh, anything you're doing. Uh, take your time, and uh, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Now, this has been such a pleasure being on this program and talking to you. I've really enjoyed it. Um, yeah, the book is called Playing Through the Pain. It's going to be coming out in the spring. Uh, really looking forward to it. It's available for pre-order right now on Amazon and other sites. But obviously, next year it will be 
in bookstores. Uh, in addition to that, I recently started the Substack. It's uh, dangoodstuff.substack.com. Uh, and my Twitter is dgood73. Uh, so it's been a real pleasure being a part of this and, uh, and talking to you. Uh, no, no doubt. And thank you for, for coming on. And I look forward to, you know, may, you know, I don't think you have to be uh, a Ken Caminiti fan. I think this book is going to be very interesting. Uh, just the same, even if you're just a baseball fan or a fan, especially of that era uh, in the sport, I think it's going to be a very important piece. And uh, uh, like you said, probably should have been done sooner, but uh, better late uh, than never. And we're, we're going to get it. Uh, in April and looking forward to it. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks. That's Dan. Good. Thanks, Dan. Uh, take care. We'll, we'll see you soon. You too. Bye.